held in the right posture and ensure that you don't get yourself all laid back and relaxed because you're home. Um, yes, I'll just pay attention to a few things today. Are we still good? Okay, let me just go for it. Let's go into the world. Let's go in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your spirit that you have so richly given unto us upon your resurrection. Our hearts are full of thanksgiving, and we say thank you, Lord Jesus. We ask and receive this evening that the truth of God's word is taught with accuracy, with clarity, with precision. There is no confusion. There is no contradiction. Our hearts are receptive to receive the word of truth this evening, and we declare and decree that at the end of today's meeting, as since we are edified and Christ alone is glorified. Hallelujah. And well, go all the way with me to um, 2 Timothy, to the 3. 2 Timothy, to the 3. Let's go for it today. 2 Timothy 3, um, look at verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Um, so it says, And that from a child that was known the Holy Script, just verse 15 rather, um, 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It now says in verse 16 All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that a man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Look at that carefully. The scriptures are given by inspiration of God and they are profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Um, we said the word they're profitable is the word that is advantageous. So scriptures are advantageous um, for doctrine. The word their doctrine is the word teaching. So we have the scriptures as an advantage for us to use um, in our teachings or to teach. Okay? Um, it also says that... Um, for correction, that word the correction is a word that means to rectify, to align or realign or to strain up. And we said that the word uh, uh, um, um, profitable, they're advantageous, the word doctrine, they're teaching. So we, we said particularly that as students of the word, where we teach from is scriptures. So we don't teach our experiences. Now, experiences are good. Yeah, experiences have a way to encourage you and to spur you and get you in the direction of you know, believing that, you know, you're not the only one having certain things or going through certain things. So experiences are good. But for the believer, the word of God is the final authority of our lives. So we don't subject the word to our authority. We subject our, uh, rather, we don't subject the word to our experiences. We subject our experiences to the word, right? That's very, very important. Eh? Because, you see, in this world we are in, People will have different experiences. People will have different encounters. People will have different um, uh, um, things they will go through at different phases of their lives. But you must understand, for the believer, um, the word of God should be the final authority over your life, right? So your experiences are good, um, but we don't teach our experiences in place of the word. Uh, we can bring in a few experiences here to further buttress some points in scriptures, but our experiences are not the teaching of God's word. Okay, uh, so uh, our experiences would only and should only be fine tuned uh, uh, um, into what the word of God says or what God's word teaches or what God's word says, right? So, scripture and Paul says scriptures are given by inspiration of God and they are advantageous. Um, it says for advantageous for teaching, advantageous for correcting, advantageous for also instructing. So, we find the advantage of scriptures for our everyday growth as believers those are very very important to pay attention to now we started looking at some principles in bible interpretation and we said what are the things you need to pay attention to when interpreting your bible we paid a lot of attention to acts 7 stephen's teaching before his death um paying attention to genesis drawing a straight line all through the writings of the prophets all the way to isaiah right and we said that it's very important to understand that in their world or their various worlds in this world what I mean is, um, the people that lived in the 18th century are not the people that are living in the um, 21st century now. And they're not the people who are living BC uh, 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 um, years, AD, whatever it is, right? So in the Moses' in Moses's world, um, the experiences will not as much be the same experiences, exactly the same experiences um, into the, um, what do you call it, to the uh, um, world of Peter and Paul. And even Jesus. However, 
we find Peter Paul going back to the world of Moses' writings to pay attention to what he said. So uh, we said some of the principles you need to hold on to in Bible interpretation or things you must always remember or key points to hold on to. I said number one, you must always remember the Bible wasn't written in English, right? The Bible wasn't written in English at all, right? It wasn't originally written in English, but it's been translated slash interpreted uh, uh, into uh, English in our world today because we're in an English world. You know, we said something around how the Bible is not an English. The Bible is not a British book. Neither is the Bible an American book. The Bible is Middle Eastern originally, so the biases of Middle Eastern people would actually be the bias that we need to understand fundamentally in scriptures. Okay? So we said the Bible wasn't written in English. Um, so that, that's why you hear us as a church. We say the Greek word is, the Hebrew word is, the Greek word is, the Hebrew word is. Um, you know why? Because we need to go back into the original writings of scriptures to understand what is being communicated. Right, and we look at two examples John 14 to John 15 to in my father's house, I many mansions. Um, John 15 to as well, where we say, um, I'm the vine, father is a um, husband, man, and all of that. Any, any, any branch in there doesn't bear fruit, it cuts away, it takes away. And we said that word there, you need to understand the word in the Greek for it to make sense to you. And um, if you put that verse of the Bible across different portions of scriptures. Right, because John chapter ten will say, "No one can pluck me out. No one can pluck us out of the hands of the Father." Uh, right, so it means that by default, um, God is not looking for who to cut short or reduce their lives because they are not bringing forth fruit. Right, so what God does is He supports, He uplifts, He prunes. Okay, and uh, we said the second point to put hold on to is the Bible was originally uh, was not originally written in chapters and verses. That's very important to note that the Bible wasn't written in chapters and verses. And we said not until the um, 13th century and the 16th century did we have um, the Bible divided into chapters by the man called Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, and Robert um, Stephanos as well, who was a French scholar in the 16th century. So that was hundreds of years ago. Uh, are we together? So uh, it means that if you look through time, right, there were more centuries. So if 13th century was when you have um, the Bible written into divided into um, verses, um, chapters rather, um, 13th century, um, it means that there was a lot of years or there were several years before that event or activity was done by um, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So it's very important to know your Bible um, uh, was not written in um, English, number one. Number two, your Bible wasn't divided into chapters and verses, right? It was over time um, that we started seeing uh, um, people come up to take up that responsibility so that they can be easily memorized and brought into accessibility by people when they come together. So you must also understand that um, if, you, if, you, if you want to be a good student of the Bible, you need to actually pay attention to the Bible holistically. And that's why um, I would always counsel and advise that if you want to, you should actually, um, as much as possible, get a Bible that doesn't have your right of reading into verses and chapters. It just help you flow into your reading. In fact, today, what I'll do is I'll give you two examples. Right? I'll show you two examples today as to how verses can mislead. Um, I can show you Philippians 5, I can show you Philippians 3, um, I can show you James 4, yeah? um, I can show you Isaiah 1. Yeah, we we'll just we have quite a number we can use to show, and you just realize that, we, we saw Exodus 1 a few days ago, you just realize that reading it in context, or reading as a whole, without the chapters and verses, would help you better. That's the truth. Yeah? You see, the Bible, without chapters and verses, will actually help your interpretation better. If you, if you look at the Bible as thought patterns grouped into paragraphs, right, it will help you in your interpretation. So we said the Bible was not originally written in chapters and verses. Uh, we said another point here, number three, which I believe is number three in your note. The Bible wasn't written with punctuation marks. A punctuation mark placed at the, at the, at the beginning of a sentence or at the second, after the second word of a sentence can change the entirety of that sentence. Um, a, a, an exclamation mark, or a, you know, a, 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 a what do you call it? A, a, a what do you call it? A punctuation mark, generally, a comma, a full stop, a semicolon placed at different points of the sentence can change the entirety of that sentence. A quick example we saw was the example of let us eat daddy, right? I would say that you say let us eat and put the comma after the daddy or after the us, uh, let us eat after the eat, 
right? You are saying, Daddy, let us eat. But if you don't put a, a conclusion mark there, it can be read as, let us feast on Daddy. So we looked at that example. I said, the next point there is, you must understand the Bible was or is full of figures of speech. Uh, you see, you cannot afford to take literal, that which is figurative in scriptures, and take figurative, that which is literal in scriptures. So there are literal statements that are made in scriptures. However, there are very, 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 there are plenty of figurative statements that are also made in scriptures. So it's very important for you to know that, you see, when you start, so we're going to look at figures of speech today, probably you have time, right? When you start hearing us say things like, that's a simile, that's a person signification that's a metaphor right it's not just to be known you see your bible should be considered as a book of literature in the real sense uh, uh, meaning that grammatical structures lexicons and constructs will be applied in reading and understanding your bible i will together you must understand that fact right whilst it looks like a literature book it doesn't end as a literature book right it's god communicating his will his plan to your life or to you or for your life to you yeah, you must you must have that at the back of your mind. So we said the Bible has lots of figure figurative statements, lots of literal statements. Be sure to know where to drop the line. We said another point there is observe the reason for communication. And we said um, the goal or reason for communicating of a language rather is to communicate. And we said that the meaning or understanding of what is said or heard is dependent on three factors. I hope, I expect that you should be quoting the factors with me as well as I'm saying because you've um, been around for the past um, two, um, five, four days, two to five days. I would say, observe the reasons for communication. The goal or reason for language is to what? Communicate. We said, number one, the writer is very important or the author who is speaking or the speaker. The author is very important. The text and the construct is very important. And we also say the reader and the understanding of the reader uh, about the writer or the reader's understanding of the writer. Very important. Simple. I am speaking, right? You are listening, right? And for you to, uh, for a third party to make sense of our conversation. Else, you will be, you know, there's a word called poknosing. Yeah, poknosing. So when you are putting your mouth in a matter that doesn't concern you, Right, you see, it, 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 if a believer actually takes that mindset into uh, um, their Bible interpretation, it might help you a little because it just makes you understand and see that well, you were not in that conversation. So, to make or to have a granular view of what is being communicated or being spoken about, you have to sit and understand the words of both people who are in communication. So, think about it this way um, there is me, Joshua, speaking to you. You are listening to me. I'm the author. I'm the speaker. I'm the writer. You're the reader. You're the listener. Right? Then there's a third party, which is who you are today. Yeah? Because when Joshua and you, so the, yeah, you get the point. Yeah? So you are not, you are the third party, but in my example, I'm making you the listener. Are <laughs> you getting the point? So let me say that differently. So you are the listener, right? Or no, let me say that differently. I am talking to a third party. Right, I am talking to a third party. I'm the writer, and the person that is listening to me is my listener or my reader. You are a third party, right? To make sense of our conversation, you've got to understand that I am in a world, or in my world, there are words that are being used that you might not relate to or be able to communicate with. Now, together, so you must understand who the writer is, what the writer is saying, the text, what is being communicated. How are words constructed in my in my ideology, so to say, right? And the readers understand it. So it means that if I'm Moses, I'm speaking to the children of Israel as a third party. Yeah? Moses is the speaker. The children of, of Israel are the listeners. You as a third party in 2024, you will have to see it in the world of the listeners and the speaker so that you can hear what they heard. So when Moses will say, right, there is such a thing called um, the rib was taken from a man and the man fell into deep sleep. You must understand that they did not hear rib of that or as that part of the body that your skeleton labels for you. I was together, right? Yeah. So a lot of us believe that, you know, a woman is taken from the rib. Like, think about it, right? Yeah. You are a baby before you got to where you are today. I was together. So, you are, so how did God now... Take the rib of. Do you understand? Before you become a baby born, you were as small as a dot or small as whatever you want to call it. Then you grew in the womb. At what point did they remove your rib and give your rib to another woman? If somebody will say, "Well, it's a supernatural." Exactly the point. Yeah, the Bible is is actually a Bible or a book that you must consider a supernatural background 
and a natural background because it's a combination of both. I don't get that. So, at, at, at what point did your rib? So, let's say you're a young man or an old man or anyone get married uh, or not married. You are listening to me, right? And let, let's say for one who is not married, for instance, right? And they've taught you that you have a rib. You have a missing rib. Yeah. See, anything that makes you find out you have a missing rib, my dear brother, you've got to go to the hospital. Yeah. Whilst you go to the hospital, we give you prayer from behind, right? But you've got to go to the hospital. You get the point, yeah? So, uh, uh, the question now becomes, at what point? Is it that every man on earth now gets into the same experience of Adam or we experience the experience of Adam in, in Adam? We are going to get troublesome if we keep going to those unending conversations, on unending genealogies or unending narratives. So, say, how together, at what point did your rib, your, so the woman you got married to, right? At what point did she become your missing rib? Yeah. So what happens to a man who, um, for instance, uh, the, 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 the first woman he got married to um, decided to leave him or something happened and she had to transition, right? He has to go, that means he's going to take another person's rib or go to two ribs and prepare two ribs for him. You get the point. What happens to a woman who gets married to a man that is that she's older than? Yeah, and what you're just really saying is that your your, your man is probably your rib, <laughs> or God ahead of that. You will get so confused. So you must understand that when Moses would have used that word salah in the Bible or in what you call Genesis two, uh, he wasn't going. They were not going to be seeing a skeletal human. No, no, that's not what they were seeing. So we said you must understand the author, the speaker, the text of scriptures, or the text of speaking, the constructions of words, the use of words, the use of language, then also the reader's ideology of the speaker. So if Moses fundamentally wrote Genesis, we said Moses was born in the world of Egypt. If you remember yesterday, we did some calculations. We said the children of Israel got into Egypt um, at point X. That was the point where um, Jacob and 11 of his sons with 70 people. When Stephen gave a recap of the number of people of Israelites that came into Egypt, he says three score and 15 souls, if I remember, 75. Yeah, which is why we say it's around 70 plus thereabout that came in with Jacob all the way to Egypt. I went together and we now saw that at the point when Moses would have led the people out or to start the journey to lead them out, he was 80. Right, and if he was eighty at that point, it means that before then, or or uh, he said we saw a record that forty years before then was when he ran away from Egypt to the Midianites, where he found a woman and he got married to Jethro's daughter. All together, right, and then from there, and before then, he had lived forty years in Egypt. All together, right. So we now said that Moses grew up in the house of a king, in the house of a of a, of a, of a ruler, what we can say, governmental staff. That means he was, he was exposed to the best of educations. So if Moses is now going to be the one to communicate Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy to humanity or to his world, yeah, that is his world, um, it means that he would need to actually use their understanding of language to communicate things to them. So in your world, you will hear Tower of Babel. <laughs> you will think that people came together and wanted to build a building that would touch the sky. Right, what you call a sky. So, in our world, we see that as a skyscraper. In their world, there could not have been anything called skyscraper because skyscraper is only made possible by the advent of technology, right, and scientific know hows over the years. So, you would have, if you say, Oh, there was Tower of Babel, and you know, we've looked at Tower of Babel just briefly as a church. Right, and when we said that they didn't come together to build a tower, and they now said this is Tower of Babel. No, there was this catching that happened. You know, there was something that happened. It failed up, or failed away, or fell away, and they now gave it that name. So you must understand that when Moses will be teaching them about the story of Tower of Babel, because none of them in Exodus who would actually have been there when the Tower of Babel was being built, but they would have heard about it through oral tradition. But when Moses would tell them, they didn't have an idea of tower. How would they have? They didn't have an idea of tower as per, you know, 200 story building. No, no, right? But if you look closely to the words that were used, you will find out that that word used for, you know, uh, uh, that tower of Babel concept and what they were trying to build was actually the, it's actually similar to the word you call shrine in your world today. Yeah, yeah, you call it a shrine, which for us to sound godly or spiritual, let's call it a temple. 
<laughs> that's still tricky because you know when you think of temple as well in our world you see when, they, when you tell a christian and that i'm going to temple in our world you know that a lot of our, a lot of christians will not think something godly i hope you know so let me say that differently if i say i'm going to the shrine yeah if I say I'm going to the shrine today to, uh, or tomorrow, I'm going to the shrine. meet me at the shrine tomorrow. <laughs> you know, you get walked up and you know what, what's Pastor saying? Yeah, but in their world, they had names for these things and they they, they, they had representation for this. There were representations for these things, right? So when Moses would tell them about Noah's Ark, tell them about you know the safety of a man in Noah's Ark and what God's plan wanted to be and what God gave instruction. They were not going to be seen as much a sheep as we are in our world today. Altogether, no, they were not going to be seen as much as that, right? So we said that you must understand the writer, the speaker, and his intention. You must understand the text of his constru- the constructions. We said you must understand the readers or those who listened. Now we said there are four gaps to bridge in Bible study. We said number one, there's the cultural gap. There's a language gap, gap rather. There's the history gap, and there is the um, geography. I'll say it one more time. There's the culture. There is the language. There's the history. There is the geography. Right? There's the culture. Right? There's a culture. There is the language. There is the history. There is the geography. So these gaps are things that need to be bridged. Now, if you look at what I'm trying to say to you with those four words or those four names, you'll find out that I'm actually as much talking about their world. Because their world will be made up of culture, made up of language, made up of history, made up of geographical locations. Altogether. So it's very, very, very important to pay attention to the world that is being what in view or that is being considered. Very, very, very important. Altogether, right? In your world, for instance, right? If I say somebody is dressing naked, or if I say I saw someone's nakedness, right? What will come to your mind in the real sense and will as much be somebody without clothes? Let me show you something. Go to Leviticus 20. Leviticus chapter 20. Go to Leviticus 20. Let me just show you something briefly uh, uh, and today. Just so that it can make sense to you why it is very important to understand and consider their world when you are interpreting your Bible. Look at Leviticus chapter 20. Look at something quickly there. Look at verse 17. Should I start 17? Look at verse 17. It says, If a man shall take his sister, listen carefully, if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, right, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness. It is a wicked thing. How many of us grew up with our siblings seeing them without clothes? <laughs> right? So he says, um, he says, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness. It's a wicked thing. And they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He had uncovered the sister's nakedness. Right? He shall bear his iniquity. And if a man shall lie with a woman having a sickness, right, and shall uncover her nakedness, he had discovered her fountain, and she had uncovered the fountain of her blood, and both of them shall be cut off from among their people. Dear saints, you are not spoken to in Leviticus 20. You know, and I said something a few days ago. We always find it easy um, to run to the book of, uh, to relegate the writings of the prophet, except when it comes to money matter. Yeah, that's why you see, I've not found that. You don't find a preacher who wants to preach that prosperity is the gospel, and you will not go to Abraham. Mm, they will have to go to Abraham. They have to go to Noah. They will have to go to, I don't know where they saw the world. They will have to go to Cain that built the city. Even Cain. <laughs> they will go to Isaac. They will go to Moses. You see, that's what we do. But when we now go through all this narrative, we're like, no, no, that's under the old covenant. We're now under grace. Say grace. <laughs> Look at what the scripture says in verse 19. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, 
nor of thy father's sister. What is this saying? Right? Uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister. So think about your mother, her sister. Don't uncover her nakedness. Okay? Alright? He says, um, um, For he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear his iniquity. Now look at verse 20. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, okay? He had uncovered his uncle's nakedness. Altogether, they shall bear their sin, and they shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing, he had uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be what? So, what will you get as uncovered nakedness in Leviticus 20? Mind you, you should read Genesis all the way through to Deuteronomy as a book, as a story, or as a merging of stories. So, what I'm trying to say is, you must not get carried away thinking that Genesis to Deuteronomy are chronologically written. You must find out, you must understand that they, each of those texts of scriptures, they are backgrounds for themselves. Right? So they are intertwined, they are interconnected, they are interwoven, they got to be understood collectively, together as a whole. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Right? So what have you seen as uncover your sister's nakedness? Uncover your uncle's nakedness. To uncover your uncle's nakedness will mean, look at it clearly, just look, look at your Bible. Verse 20, if a man shall lie, what does it mean lie with? It means lay with. That means to have sexual intercourse with his uncle's uh, with his uncle's wife, uncle's wife, yeah. In having intercourse with his uncle's wife, what has he done? He has seen the nakedness of his uncle. Was his uncle in the room? No. Are you seeing what I'm showing you? Right. So he says, and if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he had uncovered his uncle's nakedness. Just take that statement. If a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, so think of your uncle, right? Think of your uncle's wife. Right? I didn't say, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm just trying to put it into family tree. Please, I beg you. Right? Don't think of your uncle <laughs> at this point. Right? But he's saying, if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, right, he had uncovered his uncle's nakedness. Let me tell you a question. In our world, whose nakedness is the man seeing? In our world, the nakedness the man is seeing is actually the nakedness of the wife of his uncle. But that's nakedness in your world. But what is Moses teaching? Moses is teaching that of a truth. So it means that in the real sense, if you merge both worlds together, that man is seeing two nakedness. He's seeing both the nakedness of the woman he is sleeping with, right? And the nakedness of the, un of the uncle who was not even in the room or in the picture at all. All together. So you can pick that and now go back to read Noah's story, right? Yeah? And... Think about how a child will see the naked. Yeah, that, that should help you a little. Right? So, we said there are three ways you can understand script or that scriptures are actually explained. One, we said a lot of people use their experiences and visions and testimonies. I want to get Are testimonies good? Oh, bless you. See, don't ever get yourself in a place where you don't believe the miraculous. Yeah, you know, like, like I, I've, I've told you in church before, right? don't downplay the miraculous. Don't always be thinking that any miraculous you see is fake. No. If you put your mind in that place, you will rarely be ready to receive the miraculous from God. How together? And it just goes as much to show how tampered your heart has been. How together? When, when you see someone minister a word of knowledge, and the first question you are thinking is that the person has, um, the person has information that the person wants to go and check on wherever. Yeah, it just it is just goes as much to show your heart has been the devil has been playing a long game on your heart and he's winning. That's the truth, right? That's the truth, right? Because because the question is okay, yes, there are people who do fake miracles, do fake numbers, and have the crown people's information, and you know. But the question is, why are you watching those videos? Why are you paying attention to those videos? I'll tell you for free, right? A couple years ago, I started... Uh, so, uh, my, the, my, my quest for the supernatural, so to say, had been in existence for a while. In fact, I, 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 I always say that uh, my quest for the supernatural was something that was established in me by my father. You know, it had been there for over a decade. It had been there because I had seen him operating the things of the Spirit. Right? So, it's something that I, I followed after, tailored after, admired from afar. Yeah, so my father was one who, when people want to go on a trip, they <laughs> right, they can call him to ask questions. Should we go with the plane land? <laughs> right? Or my father was one who, when some people want to employ people in their company, 
right? After you submit your CV, you do interview. And the, the, the CEOs of the company will bring the names of the people they want to employ to him. Five names. Who should... Yeah, so, you see, I saw, I grew up seeing those things out together. And for once, none of, that, none of it failed out together. So, I saw the supernatural firsthand. Right now, I realized that uh, um, there's another man who I started following after you know, uh, uh, um, um, probably over a decade ago, definitely over a decade ago, and I followed actively. Right, and my quest and step for the supernatural increased drastically. You see, but what was lacking was the doctrine behind all of these supernatural things. I was together, but thankfully, now I found myself in very recent years that is much more recent, maybe seven, eight years ago. I, I found myself starting to. You know, you know, doubt the supernatural. That so I want to minister, give certain information, yeah, give certain things about what God is saying to people by time and different narratives, right? But in my head, I'm scared. I'm scared because I'm thinking, what did the people I'm talking to think I researched on them? <laughs> See, that my, my heart was going. So I had to caution myself, call myself back. Yeah, to the point that if you send me any unnecessary rubbish, right? You see, that's why some of you know. Yeah, some of you have said to me, Pastor, what do you think about this? But when I started, I see that it's about supernatural. I just I just tell you I don't know anything about it altogether. And for a lot of people, I've told you, don't send this to me again in your life. Yeah, in your life, don't send me any false miracle. Don't don't try it. Don't send it. What am I doing myself? I'm guarding my heart. I'm guarding my heart. Yeah, because we are impressionable people, right? We are people who are influenced by the things we see, or the things people see around us, or the things we see. Now together, right? So if your first slant to a miraculous experience, somebody is on a wheelchair, and the person stood up by the power of God, and the first thing your mind went to is they went to organize wheelchair. You are in trouble. You are in trouble. You are in trouble. You are in serious trouble. That's why you cannot afford to be able to logicalize everything about the Christian faith. That's why it is called faith. I want to get that. The Jesus you believe in, you didn't see him. You were not there. Yeah? You were not there. <laughs> For all it may be, there are people who believe he never existed. There are people who still believe today his body was stolen. You get it? So that's why it's called faith. Somebody was in, somebody, somebody is walking on, 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 on crutches, right? And the person takes his crutches and starts running around. You say, no, they want to organize them. Your ma- it means you've watched comedy, yeah? You've watched things that have downplayed comedy. You've, uh, uh, that, that, that have comedic- comed- comedicalized your spiritual faith, yeah? Yeah? You see, there are some, there are some, there are some comedians, yeah? I, I, used, I used to watch all these content creators, yeah? Like I always tell you, I can take out 10 minutes of my day, 15 minutes of my day, maybe once in three days or once in a week, and just go to their page and laugh. But there are specific ones that are, that are clean, but the moment you start entering things that are naughty, or you start entering things of the Christian faith, there's one he calls his name. Uh, let me not give you his name. Yeah, there's one he calls. His, he, he meets you in your no. Yeah, yeah. So the moment I realize that's the path he goes, there's no need to see his video. Yeah. Once I see his video, I report. Once I see his video, I report. Once I see yeah, for my sanity. Else you will find out. You will get to a point where you will not be able to receive the supernatural again. Yeah, I don't know, that's not my emphasis for this teaching. But I don't know who I'm speaking to. But be very careful. See, as long as I'm your pastor, right? I'm warning you, be very careful. Don't allow things that downplay the supernatural around you. Yeah, when you're always trying to explain the supernatural in a way, you are getting into trouble. See, may not be a time when you are in need of a supernatural intervention that you're not beginning to think of how you wish you did not downplay the things of the Spirit. Altogether, may you not get to that point. Altogether, right? So we said that there are people who use their experiences, people who use miracles to explain. But that's all. so. You see, I did all those rants right now. <laughs> I did all those rants right now to so just show you that no matter how miraculous the miracle is, are we together? We don't use our miracles to explain scriptures. Did you get what I just said? Right? So all those rants you heard me just say for the last two minutes or three minutes or five minutes or whatever time you, you want to call it, right? Is to let you see that p- people use their experiences. I went together. People have visions. People have out of body experiences. People have revelation seeing angels, right? But no matter the number of angels you see, we subject to a large extent to the word of God. You know why? You know why it is safer? See, if there is no false doctrine, or if there is no solid doctrine or sound doctrine, there will be no need to warn against false doctrine or false teachers. There will be no need. Because how do you know which one is true? 
you see, if there is no fact, if there is no original one thousand uh, uh, one thousand pound notes, they cannot be fake. Out together, right? Uh, so uh, imagine, for instance, in the UK, you, the, the, I think the highest denomination per note is fifty pound, fifty pound notes. Out together, imagine some. It, so, see, so somebody can come and someone can come and so someone can come and actually give you a gift in an envelope and put fifty pounds in twenty places in the envelope and give you as a gift. Now you say thank you, you are happy. Now you know when you get home, you can open that envelope, right, and you see fifty pounds all together, right, and you are just excited. Wow, one, two, three. You count twenty pieces. That's my thousand pounds all together. Then you go to the bank. Then you try to hand it over to the cashier at the bank, and they pick it and they do what they always do. They always, do, you know, some of them will use marker to write on it. Some will tear it. Some will, some will want to turn it and twist it and look at it like this. Right? And when they're doing like this, they don't know their head, not their head, not their head. And before you know it, they just, they just press one button. Before you know it, you just look back, police around you to the praise of his glory. <laughs> you see, the only way somebody can deceive you with a fake 50 pound note is because there's an original 50 pound note. That's the truth. Right? If you told me that you were deceived, that the person that gave you a gift gave you 1,000 pound note in 20 places, <laughs> that's a lot to say about your person. <laughs> How it together, and you went home, you counted it, then you took it to the bank. <laughs> that has a lot to say about the person. What am I saying? Right? There cannot be, there is no need to warn against false 50 pounds notes. You see, the, the government doesn't need to warn against a hundred pounds notes or a one thousand pound note. The government doesn't need to warn about that, right? But the government can warn about 50 pound notes. You get so there's no if, if, if there is no one way it should look like if there is no if there's no particular structured way or structured way it should look like why would there be a need to teach and to warn against false prophets? Very important, not all together. So we say we don't use experience, we don't use visions, we don't use miracles, testimonies, no matter how ambiguous they are. Right? We don't we don't we don't use you don't we don't use all of those things to understand or explain scripture. We said number two, some people use philosophies, thoughts, cultural biases, cultural bias in your world. Altogether, right? And I would say that and said number three, the, the biblical and apostolic way to explain scriptures is using the Bible to explain the Bible. That's why you see us in God's palace, right? You remember a brother came to church recently for the first time in God's palace, right? And 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 one of the things he said after the meeting, when he was just asked to speak, he said, "Well, wow, that's the one. That's the first time in his life that they opened several scriptures in the church garden all together." What a what what a testimony! But what am I saying about that? Yeah, we use the Bible to explain the Bible. That is why we always call scriptures in the Bible that you need to go to, then go to, then come from, then go to. Altogether, so we need to use the Bible to explain the Bible, not our experiences. It's very, very important to do. So now, one of the bridge, so one of the rules we said is that you, you you have to read the Bible in context. There's a context for every scripture. Altogether, together. So let's go to Philippians four. Oh, oh let, let's go to Philippians three. I've done Philippians four a lot. Let me do Philippians three today. Philippians chapter three. If you would with me to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Are we here? Have you gone? You're home. You're watching me from home. Yeah, so look at Philippians uh, chapter. Uh, um, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm. Look at Philippians chapter 4, uh, chapter 3, sorry. Now look at verse 10. Look at this scripture, Philippians 3 verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Oh Lord, dear saints, let's begin to pray today. That I may know him. Paul says that I may know him. Lord, that I may know you. Lord, as Paul said, Lord, God, Lord, Lord, as I may, that I may know you and the power all together, the power of the Lord, dear Lord God Jesus. Now, in all of us, we've picked that scripture and made it a prayer point. But the question is, was Paul praying? You see, history shows this is one of the last letters of Paul. So, are, are we saying that Paul, in one of his last letters, was crying to know God? You know, if we're wrong with that narrative, someone can wake up tomorrow. 
and give the world a revelation that Jesus showed him personally. And he will say, after all, Jesus, uh, Paul said, that I may know him. You know, one of the issues that some, you know, uh, um, unbelievers have regarding Paul is that who accredited Paul? Why do we believe Paul? Yeah. So if you're on evangelism and you have that question asked to you, the straightest answer to give you is, you, so how I handle it is simple. You try to pick another disciple of Jesus who the person you are talking with believes. Yeah. One of the easiest to pick is Peter. Yeah, people don't doubt that Peter was with Jesus and Peter was the type of Jesus. But the problem is that people doubt that Paul was, or Paul is solid and concrete enough to be able to give doctrine because he never met Jesus altogether. One of the ways to do it is just simple. Who is Peter? Peter was the one who you can vouch for and said Jesus asked him to teach. Okay, so Jesus gave Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lamb. Simple, straightforward. Do you agree? Yes. So you make them agree with that. Once they agree with that, you show them Peter's validation of Paul. Let me show you. Look at Second Peter. Go to Second Peter three. Yeah. So th- this is this is alongside the series we are doing in church and the UK engaging the streets. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I just give you a quick tip there. Right. So you 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 look at so to what extent is Paul's letter a valid scripture or valid enough to be scriptures or valid enough to be final authority for the believer. Are we together? Yeah, because people argue with a lot, right? That oh, Paul was not Paul. Paul, how can you believe Paul? Paul taught this, you know. And find out that a lot of topics, Paul was the one that addressed them and touched them. Look, look at Second Peter three, Second Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. So look at what Peter said. So Peter, who was one, right? So Peter was one, right? Who, in the real sense, Jesus handed over the responsibility of the early church to Peter, Piro, Peter. Yeah? So look at what Peter says at the end, at the end of the second letter. So Peter, who Jesus asked to lead the local church or to lead the church in the real sense, he wrote only two letters, what you call the first Peter and the second Peter. So look at what Peter says in Second Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 15. He says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That means take into company sense or take into account that the long suffering of our God is to save man. So he says, even look at what Paul says. But Peter, Peter says, even as our beloved brother Paul. So one, Peter acknowledges Paul as a brother in the faith. That means Peter knew Paul. How together? Peter knew Paul. Peter knew Paul. Another example you can use is the narrative of Barnabas and how Barnabas became influential um, in Paul's ministry, right? But but if that is too complex, that's in the in, in book of Acts, you can just stay with 2 Peter 3, right? He says, even as our beloved brother Paul, look at what Peter says about Paul. Also, according to the wisdom given unto him, he has written unto you. Now, so what he says, right? He says, as also in all his epistles. So Peter knew about the epistles of Paul. Are we together? So at the time, Peter knew about the epistles of Paul. And Peter says, also in all the epistles of Paul, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, the rest will they fight. So Peter is saying, <laughs> yes, so the things that Paul taught, people wrestle them. He says, as they do also with other scriptures. So when you see people fighting, I don't believe Paul, I don't Paul. Who is Paul? Paul. Do you get my right? Yeah, yeah. So Peter just says, well, according to the epistles of Paul, that means Peter acknowledges that he knew that Paul had epistles. He knew Paul was a beloved brother, right? And he probably read Paul's epistles as well, one way or the other. Are we together, right? So if you look at Galatians 2, so see what Paul says about Peter. <laughs> yeah, see what Paul says about Peter. Galatians 2, uh, if I'm not mistaken, verse 11. Galatians 2, verse 11. Okay. So, look at Galatians 2. <coughs> look at verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever the way, it make it no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of their circumcision was committed unto me, and the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter, verse 8, For he that wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. So it means that 
Paul had an emphasis or an emph emphatical audience or an audience he was emphatic with. And Peter had an audience he was emphatic with. Peter to what? Um, to, to the people of the circumcision, right? And Paul towards the Gentiles. Look at verse 9. When James Kephas, John, who seemed to be the pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. That means they had interaction. And when they interacted with Paul, they said there was something about Paul. <laughs> something about Paul. Something about Paul. Something about Paul. <laughs> yeah. So he says, and when Jesus and Kephas, right, if you know that song, uh, then it means we need to wash your mind and regenerate our minds together. Hallelujah. Right. So, uh, uh, um, and when James Kephas and, J and John was seen to be, pillars perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. I was together that they should go unto the heathen and they, that we should go unto the heathen rather and they unto the circumcision. That means Peter more to the Jewish family, right? Then Peter, then Paul to the Gentiles, non Jewish. You get, you get the point, right? Yeah. That's why you see the, the letters Paul wrote there to Gentile nations. Yeah. Look at verse 11, right? Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Now look at verse 11. Look at what Paul says. Oh, Paul. Paul that did not sit under the teaching of Jesus face to face, right? Look at what Paul says. But when Peter came to Antioch, Antioch, so Peter came to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. That means Paul interacted with Peter. Peter accredited, ascertained, gave, uh, what's the word? Um, he gave, he gave, what's the word? There's a word, there's validation, that's what. So Peter gave validation to Paul and it was open. People knew about it. Such that Peter speaks about it in the only two letters he writes. Okay? So Paul now says, For before that, certain came from James that he did not eat to the Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? Non-Jew. All together. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, and the other Jew dissembled likewise with him, in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. That means there was division amongst the saints. What was division around? Based on ethnicity. Where are you from? Yeah? You see, people can use the Bible to teach bigotry. People can use the Bible to teach whatever thing you want to call racism. Right? Whatever it is. But if you read the Bible well, you can't get to those conclusions. I went together. You can't get to those conclusions. I went together. Yeah. So what did Peter? What did Paul now say? Paul now said in verse fourteen, "When I saw that they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel." So what is the truth of the gospel? It is both Gentiles and Jew. The gospel is for all. Do you remember Peter's experience? Peter had a vision, right? And the vision, an angel came and brought and uh, four 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 footed beast animals to him. And in the vision, the instruction that was given to Peter is: Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Peter rise, kill, and eat. Peter rise, kill, and eat. Right? And when that happened, the Bible says that Peter woke up and he thought on the dreams. Uh, he pondered on the dream. But one of the things he said was that I cannot eat that which is ungodly. Hold on. Where did Peter get the doctrine of that which is ungodly? You must not forget that Peter is Jewish. So it is a cultural thing. So when you go back to the writings of Moses and you see instructions of animals not to eat, your attention is not on dietary. Your attention is not on vegetarian. Or your attention is not on, uh, you don't like blood to be No, 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 no. The reason for those instructions is just to them particularly to influence their worship in the midst of strange nations. Yeah, that's just simple. Yeah, that's not it. This, that's not. So when Peter, so look at it though. Moses will give an instruction, there are animals not to eat. If you go back to Leviticus 20, go back to 19, 17, 18, you'll see lots of those things written all over the book of Leviticus. So Peter was in his right senses as a Jewish man to say, I, I, I can't eat a an, an four-footed beast. Why am I eating four-footed beast? But in his, in his spiritual state or stand, he was being a spiritual bigot or he was being evil. He, he was one who was getting himself involved with what? Racism, so to say. Yeah? Yeah? So what did God instruct Peter after that vision? The Bible says Peter talked about it. And he said, 
Thou dare not call that which I call clean unclean. Go down, for there are men from Joppa who have come to get you. Yeah? So Cornelius also had a vision. Cornelius sent his, his men to go and pick Peter. So what was the meaning of that, of that dream? Four-footed beast was a way to communicate people who are of the non-Jewish community. So Peter in his mind was thinking that there are people who we don't segregate or relate with even though we are all Christians. Simple. Yeah? But God corrects him, right? Then he went to Cornelius' house and he preached and got all of them saved with the evidence of speaking in tongues. <laughs> then, because of that slant, you know, if, you, if you read through Acts, so I, I'm summarizing a lot for you, let, I'm, I'm codifying a lot for you. If you read through Acts 11, Acts 12, Acts 13, Acts 14, and you, you realize that. The Bible says that the, the, the elders of Jerusalem sent for Peter and they cautioned him, how dare you go into the house of Cornelius? Then he narrated the story to them. So, but Peter, Paul is saying that, well, when I saw that they walk not uprightly, so to walk not uprightly will mean not to walk in love. That means they were not walking in love towards others. They had that segregation in their minds. I was together. So he said, when you have that slant, you are not walking according to the truth of the gospel. See, when you have a slant that, yeah, you can, you say, hey, hey, some people say a woman cannot pastor them. Yeah, a, a, a woman cannot be my leader. How will a woman be my leader? What, who, what does she have to offer? <laughs> yeah, that's a spiritual, spiritual, you know, that your spiritual thermometer needs to be adjusted so that your temperature can read all right. Yeah, because you don't get to that conclusion by reading the Bible properly. Even though, yes, there are clear cut scriptures where you will read literally that might support your stand. Clear cut scriptures, clear cut scriptures, clear cut scriptures, clear cut scriptures. A woman should not talk in church. It's in the Bible, clear cut scriptures. Yeah, but we know we've done a series on, on women and women and all of that. Yeah, so you see, a woman, how can a woman lay hands on me? Woman, 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 you that is, you are an afterthought. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You only get to that conclusion. Yeah, yeah, there's something around, there's something around the thermostat, yeah, that's in your brain that just needs to be activated and properly regulated by God's word. Yeah. So, so, Peter, what I'm saying is not an insult. I'm just trying to say that. See, there's a way your bias will be. You need the renewal of your mind daily to get out of it. You need the renewal of your mind daily to get out of it. Daily, 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 daily. It's not, it's not a mistake. Daily. Because Peter as well, who learned directly from Jesus, we still say some people are unclean, in quotes. Yeah? So what did Paul say? Paul now says, well, he says, they were not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jew by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus, that we might be justified by faith of Christ Jesus, right, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no man be justified. But if we while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is death, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? So what did Paul do when he saw this dissimulation? The Bible says, I withstood Peter. Look at verse 11. When Peter came to Antioch, Paul first makes it clear. I confronted him with the truth of God's word. All together. Yeah? You must also understand there's a word, there's a context, there's a history. That is behind the confrontation. Not you just wake up and just go and every, everybody confront everybody. Just scatter, just you just want to scatter everybody. You, you just, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. The spiritual, the, the, the truth is there are spiritual responsibilities in the body of Christ. Yeah. Whilst we are all equal by the Spirit of God, we are all unique by the Spirit of God. We have the Spirit of God together. We can function in the case of the Spirit. Yeah, let me tell you for free. If they've not told you before, if nobody has told you before. Right, your responsibility in the body is not the same as your pastor. Your responsibility in the body is not the same as your local church leaders or your leaders in local church. It's not the same. It's not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. Not when you go and open YouTube channel now and go and insult everybody, right? Because you have small the, the meaning of the, you know you, because you know small Greek word. Yeah, right. The truth is you must understand that there's place, there's authority. Yeah, yeah. 
your solution to someone teaching for us is to you maintain keep teaching your keep teaching your sound doctrine. That's just it. That's why you don't see no matter what I say, that's why you don't see no matter you know, that's why you see that no matter what I say in our teachings, yeah, there are parts that will be very controversial. We don't cut out and show and create issue for people. You see, I can tell you for free, but the kind of thing, I listen to myself some of the things I've said in a couple of years, right? And the way I said it, right? Truth is, if we had gotten those videos and those clips, just we just need to throw them online, throw them online. We'll be known more than what we are known as, or more than people that know us right now today. <laughs> because we can cause trouble, can cause commotion. Right? But, what, but what's the solution to false doctrine? We stay hard on the truth of God's word, right? Yeah, so there'll be clear cut periods where we need to. So, can a Peter need to be corrected? Oh, yes. Yeah, there's a way that it needs to be done, and there's a who that needs to do it. That's the truth. Now, that does not exclude conversations with you and your leader, or you and your pastor. You get that? So, when Paul is saying that we stood him, don't just say a new Christian in faith we stood you. You should know who Paul is. You should know who Paul is before you could do that. But what am I saying to you? I just took you through a narrative to show you that, in the real sense, um, there was such a man called Paul, called a man called Peter, and if people try to invalidate Paul, yeah, just look through the scriptures, Peter validated Paul, Paul also mentions he withstood Peter, right? And there's no record in the Bible that shows us that Peter and Paul stopped talking because of that. Yeah, he was standing for the truth of God's word. Fight Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Go back to Philippians 3. So that I may know him, this Paul talking, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Oh Lord, we pray today that we may know you. No. Was Paul praying? You gotta think a little. Now, one of the things I say you should do is what? Remove chapters and verses in your Bible, right? And read in paragraphs. Let me show you Philippians 4 first. Go to Philippians 4. If you go to Philippians 4 verse 19, which is that scripture says I can do all things. Sorry, that's my gospel power means. If you go to Philippians 4 verse 13, sorry. Philippians 4 verse 13 says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Oh, yes, that's my faith confession for today. I can do all. How many, how many things? I can do what? All. How many things are all? All includes all things. All includes all things. Bible says in Corinthians that all things are mine. The cattle on 10,000 hills by 10,000 cattle and 10,000 cattle returns belong to my father. And Bible says all things are mine. If all things are mine, I'm just waiting to receive what grace has made available by faith. <laughs> you see, grace is the hand that supplies. While faith is the hand that receives. Right? I have money. It's just that I have to just, you have to just wait and receive it. How long will you wait? Will be hold until we are from? Yeah. So he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. To pick that as your positive confession for the day, for the week, for the year, is to take the Bible out of context. So what rule can you apply to this? The Bible wasn't written in English. One, the Bible wasn't written to you. Two. Right, you need Bible was written in chapters and verses up until the 13th and 16th generation uh, when they were century when they were translated slash interpreted. So, what's the best way to read the Bible in paragraphs? So, because I don't want to take you all the way to Philippians one, let's look for the closest paragraph we can start a narrative with. Right, you know, usually in writing in in, in grammatical construct in our world today, a paragraph is such a way is a way to initiate or show a new line of thought, so to say. Okay, so I can do all things which kind of strengthens me. Ugh. Okay, okay. Let's remove verse 13. So remove the number 13, go back to verse 12. I know both how to be abased. Okay, does this sound like the beginning of a thought? Go back to verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want. Does that sound like the beginning of a thought? Go back to verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Ah, that clearly is not the beginning of a thought. So before he says but, there was something that was said before. Right? Go back to verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of all peace shall be with you. Uh, those things, what are those things? He has spoken about some things before he says those things. Okay, go back to verse 8. Finally, brethren, can that be the beginning of a paragraph? Yep. So if we as a church were to put the book of Philippians into paragraphs without chapters and verses, right? Our paragraph will start from the word finally. Whilst it's verse 8 in your Bible, it means that when you get to the point finally, the line of conversation between what is about to be said and what was said might, emphasis on the word might, have changed. All together. So look how Paul says it finally. Verse 8, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, 
Whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, it says, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. So does it not make sense? Finally, so, so, and so, 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 and so, so, and so, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Okay? That now at the last your care of me had flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked the opportunity. That means Paul is saying to the Philippians that they cared for the pastor, Pastor Paul, well. Yeah? Which is a godly thing to do. I want to get it. See in our world today, everybody wants to collect from pastor. Everybody wants to, everybody wants to collect their share from pastor. Everybody wants to collect their share from pastor. Right? But very few people think that pastors deserve to be given a gift. Very few people think that pastors really deserve, or you think, I remember I, I did something on my dad's, you know, <laughs> on my dad's service of songs, right? <laughs> but I wouldn't do it again, I've grown. <laughs> but the truth is, we think that pastoring is not a, is, is not, is not a task. <laughs> yeah, we think that it's just you for some, for some, some those of you in Nigeria church place. I just think your pastor just wakes up, your pastors just wake up and they just they just feel like you know, you just, just, you just, you just, I just, I just feel like this is what I want to say today because God will just you think it's a lot, you, th- you, th- you think it's the easiest of things out together, yeah, out together. You see, to teach in the church is as much an important criteria or, or, or factor or, or, or activity of a leader or a pastor, right. But pastoring and pastoring the God way, pastoring and pastoring with the template of scriptures is not the easiest of things. In fact, uh, I, I might say, I, I'm, I'm pushed to say it's one of the most complex, if not the most complex role to play in the life of any other, any person in this world. I was together. So Paul was actually giving, or Paul was sent gifts. Gifts were given to Paul. It's a godly thing. Let me tell you, it's anti-scriptural to have a pastor for years. And you've never given 100 kobo, 100 pounds, right? 1 million pounds. Yeah, and I hope you know I'm not giving you a figure. Yeah, yeah. You are, it's, it's, it's actually you being anti That means you've either listened enough, heard, and this is not me trying to say you come and give me gift here. Yeah? The truth of God's word needs to be said. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah, I, I, I used to be shy of saying these kind of things years ago, right? Because I, I, I feel like it's like I'm asking you, no! I'm not. You know what I do. Yeah, you know I walk, right? You know I do things with my hand, right? You know your pastors walk. You know your leaders walk. Yeah, but to not scriptural, to not have an attitude of giving gifts to your pastors, it's not. It's anti scriptural. You are, in fact, you are living in disobedience to the word. There's a gift for local church. There's a gift to your leader. There's a gift for your pastor. To your pastor, it's scriptural. Yeah. So you see, they did it to Paul. Paul mentions it. I was together. Some of you don't even care about your pastor. Some of you can. Ne- Some of you, in the years I've known you, you've never reached out to me to say how are you doing, pastor. In the years I've known you, yeah. But God is our strength. We are pulling through. I was together. We are pulling through, yeah. But much more than pulling through is to have a, a kind heart. I was together. Have a kind heart. Have a kind heart. What you are going through every day, I go through it every day, and much more than that, as your pastor, yeah. What your pastors in Nigeria church are going through. Right, what your leaders are going through, I would get. I know how I train them. I know how I train them. I know how I drill them. Yeah. So it's only godly for you. You have an issue, you call your pastor. Your car tire spoil, you call your pastor. You have a dream, you wake up, you call your pastor, and that's good. That's okay. But there's such a thing called acknowledging the gift that your pastor is to you. You know, Paul teaches emphatically they are worthy. We are worthy. Not they. We are worthy of double honor. Then my bed is not around the corner, so I'm not asking you to do a birthday gift for me. But it's godly. I, you can't be pastored by, by your pastor for three years, for four years, for five years, for six years, for seven years. You've never, I know you are in a, you are, you are, you are actually, praise God. Yeah, that, that's just, the, that's just, that's just the, an instruction to, you know, some of you. And that's not, that's not about me. Anywhere you find yourself in the world, anywhere you find yourself in the world, your pastor is always the one asking you, how are you doing? How is work? How is your health? You've never asked, pastor, how is your health? Never asked, pastor, um, how is work? Pastor, how is your family? Or you think we are, we, we don't, we don't have things we go through, we actually do. And I can tell you for free, much more than you can imagine. Much more than you can imagine. Yeah, you know, like I always tell you, right? I, I, I tend to be, 
I tend to know a lot of you very well, yeah, very, very well, to a very large extent. <laughs> you know, one of the things some of you say is that how I get to know information about you within a short period of knowing you is very be bewildering. I get to know a lot about you. Uh, but in the knowing I know about a lot of you, right, very few of you are as busy as your pastors, both Nigerian and in the UK church. Very few of you, if not none that I know of. I went together. Yeah, you see, you see, I'm, you see, I'm sweating here, right? You see, before I could, before I'm teaching you what I've taught, you see, I've taught what I've taught, what I'm teaching you today. I've taught it years ago, several, right? But even before I came for this preparation, I know many hours of prayer I've put into it, right? In the last ten days, I spent nothing less than twenty hours praying for what I'm doing to you right now. <laughs> Yet I have a day where I resume to a boss, a manager, every day, every morning, every evening, every day, rather, having lots of things to do, have a family. I we together. Your pastors have family. Your pastors have things. Pastors have concerns. It's not as much as you need to have one million. Some of you say, eh, no, God knows my heart. When I have one billion, I'll give pastor one million dollars. It's not true. That's, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> that's not true. Yeah? Mind you, what I'm not talking about today is as much the quantity or quality of gifts is the genuineness and the heart behind being kind to your pastor. Behind being kind to your pastor, it is very important. Very important. A little text can change a lot. Yeah, now I'm talking, I'm talking to God's palace members, right? Yeah, so you all know me, right? You see, someone reached out to me on, on, on Instagram, a random person who I just observed for a while. I've known, I knew the person for a long time. You know, and the person just missed me from the blues and just to hear from me and spoke and, you know, we chatted and I was waiting to hear a response of, oh, uh, something's happened to me, my this is that, I need to get this and everything. And basically just said, I just you just came to me and I thought to hear from you. You needed to see how I felt. You needed to see how I felt about that. Yeah, not a member of God's palace. You needed to see how I felt. I was like, wow, that touched me. And I I, ex I, I you know, I'm very expressive. I expressed it, that touched me. Yeah, that touched me. Because in a year, I can go through a year, I'm less than five people reach out to me to ask, and I have over 500 people I'm reaching out to ask for. Let this instruct your heart. Very important. Very important. Yeah? If Paul did not talk about it, I won't talk about it. So Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last you okay, mind you, it's not as much about me. It's not as much about Pastor Timmy or Pastor Yemi. See, no. It's as much as whoever is accountable for your spiritual life at any point and phase of your life. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me has flourished. Right? There's nothing wrong in the church caring for the pastors. Don't get yourself all worked up with saying a pastor bought a private jet. That's not your business. You've never given your pastor 10 p in your life and you are, claim, you, are, you are accusing the people who came together to think their pastor deserves to get a private jet. Yeah? <laughs> What's your business with that? <laughs> What's your business with that? Get your heart busy with something else. All together. Yeah? Yeah? You don't have any business with that. The godly thing is to think and to care and be kind to your leaders. Care for your leaders. Be kind. Intentionally kind. There's nothing wrong in you putting reminders in your calendars. Right? To my, I need to hear from my pastor outside of church. It's a task I give all your leaders. Right? It's a task I give all your leaders. <laughs> and you all know they do it. I was together. Because I have a reporting meeting with them where they tell me what's happening. Yeah? So you need to ensure that you get instructed by what I just said to you. Well, that's fine. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me had flourished again. Wherein ye also are also careful, but ye lack the opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of wants. Yes, since. Not that I speak. In, let me tell you for free. Not that I speak in respect of wants. <laughs> not that I speak in respect. My rent is not due or my house, whatever, is not due or payment is not due. And I don't know. <laughs> that's not the case. I was together. Yeah. So Paul will say, well, not I speak in respect of one, for I have learned. I can say that too well, slightly. I have learned in whatsoever state I am in. <laughs> you see, there are days, right, when strange things happen, right? And when strange things happen, we spend strange money, for instance. <laughs> and all of that, we've learned. That's what Paul is teaching. Well, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am in, there we to be content. That's the greatest thing I hold on to. So when your pastor teaches you to give to your pastor, right, it's not for the benefit of your pastor. I want to get that. I believe you have a good pastor, right, which I believe you do, <laughs> right, that should be that should have learned the attitude and art of being content. Yeah. So Paul will say, well, I've learned to be content. If your gift came, if it didn't come, I'm content. But it doesn't take away the fact that it's a doctrinal thing to, to, to do. It's something that is taught in scriptures. 
To not do it is to bring the outright disobedience of scriptures or to turn deaf eyes. That's the word. Turning deaf eyes. I didn't mix the word. It's deaf eyes I'm using. All right? To the pages of scriptures and what the instruction of scripture says. All together. So it says, I know what how to obey and know how to abound. There are days when we know we have a little, we have nothing. I was together, right? Everywhere that I'm in, I know things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. That's a testimony of a pastor. He says, I can do all things. So when Paul says, I can do all things, what he's really saying is, I can do all these things through Christ, which strengthens me. So Paul is saying that I can abound, I can abase, I can abound, I can abase, I can be full, I can be hungry. Not because the food is there or is not there, because but because I derive my strength. Eh? Which Hebrews will now tell you for instance, let your conversation be with that covetousness and be content with such things as he have. For he has said, never will I leave you nor forsake you. Altogether, never will I leave you nor forsake you. So we derive strength and contentment from the ability of God on our inside. Very important to note. Very important to note. Very important to note. Very important to note. So, we just, what did we do? We went back to verse 8, and we picked verse 8, right, all the way to verse 13. We can go further. Notwithstanding, here I've done well. So, you will not, if you want to read chapter verse 8, downward as a paragraph, your paragraph will not end in verse 13. Because the next thing it says is, notwithstanding, ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my afflictions. Right now, ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. But ye all, you will say Paul is materialistic. <laughs> Are we together? Yeah, you say Paul is materialistic. Paul is saying, hey, Paul is saying, people have given me all right, but it's when it comes to you as the Philippians, no church has communicated. Mind you, Paul is not talking about the people that gave him the finest car or the biggest car. But he's talking about the attitude, the mindset. Mind you, because he speaks about the Macedonian church and the Macedonian churches, they were, they, they were a poor church. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Despite their deep, they say, Bible, Paul says they were in deep poverty. Do you get the point? So Paul is not saying that the Philippians are the greatest givers because they gave the biggest cash. No! No! 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Oh, oh, go to 7 Corinthians 8. 7 Corinthians chapter 8. Go to 7 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, go all the way to verse 1. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Let me just show you something. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. <laughs> well, I didn't, I, this was not my notes, right? But I think I've given certain instructions in today's teaching that should help your heart. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed. So Paul is teaching about the grace of God upon the churches of Macedonia. I was together. Look at what he says about the churches of Macedonia. He says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. So it means that the Macedonians were in abject poverty. That's the word deep. Deep there is not. So when you say, Pastor talked about culture, history, deep there is not figure of speech for riches. Deep means they lack physical material. That means they were in want, they were in need. Yeah? So he says, Brethren, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 1, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That means there were churches within a cold, within a clone, right? Or within an environment. Churches, listen, oh, churches of Macedonia. Are we together? What did he say about the churches? So imagine churches in Edinburgh, uh, in, in, in Edinburgh, in, in um, Aberdeen, yeah? He says, churches in Edinburgh, he says, how does in the great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of liberty. So it means that the church that Paul was talking about was a church that was poor. Uh, okay, well, if, if you miss it, go to Acts 16. Go to Acts 16. If I'm not mistaken, Acts 16. Acts 16. Is it Acts 16 verse... Uh, Acts 16, 12. Look at verse 12. Acts 16, 12. Yeah? So look at, look at what the author of uh, Luke says in Acts 16, 12. And from, so look at verse 11. 
Acts 16, book of Acts chapter 16, verse 11. Therefore, losing from trials, we came with a straight course to Samoth, to, to, to Samothria, Thracia, and the next day to Neopolis. Look at what, what verse 12 says. And from there to Philippi. Where is Philippi? Philippi is the church, the Philippians we are reading. So what is Philippi in Bible geography and Bible knowledge and Bible history? See what it says. Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. So Philippians or the Philippians were like a major in Macedonia. So Edinburgh a major in Scotland. Abuja a major in Nigeria. Right? Philippi, they were a chief city of the part of Macedonia and a colony and were in that city abiding for certain days. So what did he say about it? So no matter the no matter the part you are in in Macedonia, Paul addresses the Macedonian churches as people in deep poverty. Are you following me? So the Philippians is talking to. So go back to Philippians where we are. Philippians four. So Philippians chapter four, verse fourteen. So who is the letter of Philippians written to? The letter of Philippians is written to the chief city in a Macedonian colony or a Macedonian environment where every church there is described as churches in deep poverty. Are you following me? Right? So what did Paul say? Notwithstanding, ye have done well, that ye did communicate in affliction. Hear what Paul says. Paul says in verse 15, Now ye Philippians, so how will you write ye Philippians? Ye Philippians into brackets, yeah? What the chief city church of, uh, or the chief city of the Macedonians that are in all in deep poverty. Yeah? So it says, Now ye Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. It means that for them to have been poor, it didn't mean that what Paul was talking about was not that they gave him the biggest gift. No! No! Yes, we understand people abuse these things. I mean, in our world today, it's people that they give that give the biggest gift, right? That stay, and that's why one that's one of the things that made me stay away from these things for a while. But God started saying it to us strictly, strictly, started laying it on our hearts very instructively that we can't shy away from what the Bible is teaching because people are going to an extreme of it. No, we can't shy away from it. It's in the Bible. Yes, in our world, people get the front seat of the local church because of how much they give to the church. Yes, but that doesn't take away the fact that there's such a thing called giving to the church. That doesn't take away the fact that there's such a thing called giving to your pastor. See, Paul did not say you communicated to my local church. He said you communicated to me. Paul, look, mind you, the Corinthians were a wealthier church than the Macedonians. Yet he said, you know, so imagine Paul says, like I said earlier, in one of his last letters, he says in Philippians, he says, well, I hope you know that in all the churches that have gone to minister, no one has communicated to me regarding the matter of giving and receiving like you. What he's not saying is, you are the one that has given me the highest. That's not necessarily what he's teaching. But he's talking about the slant of their heart, despite the word, despite what they did not have. Let me say it again. The slant of their heart, despite what they did not have. Okay. So he says, no church completely. He says, but ye only. Right? He says, for even the Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my even the Sunday night, ye sent once again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift. You see? So Paul is saying, it's not because I desire. So when your pastor teaches you that you have to give to your pastor, it's not because I desire a gift. No. No. Right? It's not because I desire a gift. Not because I desire a gift. Not because your pastor desires a gift, really. It's just Bible teaching. It's Bible doctrine. Right? So you cannot not do the Bible thing. And all you can do is to say, oh, the pastor, you know, pastor, I just collect people's money. No, that's not your business. You've not given anything to your pastor. Yeah? Then, you see, there's a Greek word called femme la bouche. Yeah? Go research on it. You'll get it later. Yeah? Femme la bouche. Yeah? So, uh, that, 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 that's a, let, let me help you. It's a French word. Femme la bouche. Femme la bouche. <laughs> femme. <laughs> yeah? So, it says, for, uh, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So you being kind, being care, being caring, being careful, being loving, being generous to your pastor, whose account does they abound to? Well, you. Mind you, what we are not saying is that you sow it as a seed and it multiplies. No. What about giving a gift as a gift as an enemy in itself? <laughs> I'm talking about the ones where your 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 husband's birthday is before your birthday, so you want him to give you a very expensive gift. You now give him one major gift before you. <laughs> no. You are not trying to water the ground. That's what I'm talking about. 
What about giving generously to someone who you think is laboring? Someone who you think is intentional laboring over your soul, over your heart. Very important. I would get that. He says, but I have all and abound. I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus. The things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. They're saying it's well pleasing to God. Right? But my God shall supply. So you see where my God shall supply your needs come from? He, it came from a place, I would together, of Paul talking about people giving to his material needs. It's scriptural. It's scriptural. It's scriptural. I was together. Yeah. Let he who taught, let he who is taught the word communicate to he who teaches the word with his material substance. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Yes. Praise God for example. How did I get here? Only God knows. But I know that this is instructive to you. And I know that you will do better. Yeah, because I trust you're hearing God's word and you would act and do God's word. Okay? Yeah. Don't let your interaction with your pastor be just on Sunday. Don't let your interaction be with your pastor on Wednesday. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Don't let it be only on his birthday. No, no. Not your pastor's birthday. I'm saying it to you as one who should who should act scripturally in any local church you find yourself in the world. That's sensible, that's godly. Out together, right? So I, I just read Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. How I got here, I was just going to explain I can do all things, but bless your heart, bless my heart, Jesus is glorified forever. Now, Philippians 3 is where I'm going to. Philippians 3. So Philippians 3, that I may know him. So Paul was Paul really saying, I want us to know God. So let's do that same that same ideology we did for Philippians 4. When we went back from verse 13 and went backwards to verse 12, verse 11, verse 10, verse 9, then verse 8, I said, okay, finally seems to be like the beginning of the conversation or a thought. Yeah, so let's do the same thing for Philippians 3, verse 10. Right? That I may know him. Uh, that I may know him. Can you wake up one day and just say that I may know him? Can you wake up one day and just start with that I may know him? Okay? Let's go back to verse 9. And be found in him. Remember, we are using the English Bible, so pardon our pardon how we will get to the conclusion of where to start from. <laughs> pardon it because we are using the English Bible. Right? So English will let you know. You don't start the sentence with and. Yeah, I'm just I'm just saying. Yeah, pardon. Go back to 8. Ye doubtless, and I count all things but loss. Ah, what are all things? A lot of times, when the Bible uses the phrase all things, you will find out that it has a context. Something like all these things. So when Paul will say all things are yours, he's saying all these things are yours. What he's trying to say is that the death, the life, whatever the, you know, the apostles and pastors or your, your, your leaders go through is for your benefit. They are yours. They are for you to be profitable with. Yeah, when Paul says, I can do all these all things to Christ, he's saying, I can do all these things. What are the, all these things? Learning how to be full, how to be hungry, how to abase, how to abound. I can do these things through Christ. So if you go back to verse 8, ye doubtless, and I count all things. A good way to read that will be all these things, but don't. Okay, go back to verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Well, English says, you don't start with but, you don't start with and. Okay, go back to verse 6. So I'm, I'm showing you how to read your Bible, right? Practically. So I'm saying the, 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 the instructions I'm giving you in this teaching, the principles I'm giving you in this teaching, take it to a scripture and apply it. Go back to the context. Go back and read it. Go back verses. Read from that verse backwards. Try to make it make sense and see where the line of thought came from. Are we together? Yeah. In our subsequent meeting, what we'll do is we'll now find out how to do a lot of intercontextual dependencies. I know I taught that briefly last year. Yeah, but we'll look at it more in the practical form. What is that about? Yeah, you see how I took you to Leviticus 20. And when I took you to Leviticus 20, I mentioned about Noah and his son Ham. Right? Intercontextual dependency. Right? When we begin to understand a context of scripture with another context of scripture, right? A verse of the Bible with another verse from another verse. Right? So, mind you, in all of what you must understand in Philippians 3 is the Bible was written in chapter, was written in verses, wasn't written in English. So you must understand the author. Don't forget those three those um, things for communication. Understand the author or the writer or the speaker, right? The use of his text and his construction. This is what we're trying to do. Then you must understand the audience. So who is the audience that Paul is speaking to? He's speaking to a what? An audience which you will call a Gentile nation. So what they heard from Paul, you need to hear it well. Okay? So go back to verse 7. Yeah, go back to verse 6. Yeah, mind you, we have an extended time today because I'm not done in the next five minutes. Okay, so look at verse 6 concerning zeal. Mm, okay, look at verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day 
Mm, troublesome. No, no, that's four. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence. You, you can start the sentence there, but try to see if the previous verse will link into it. Verse three. For we are the circumcision which worship. Uh, verse four. Beware of dogs. Yeah. So this is another example of taking the scriptures literally out together. Yeah, out together. Right. So you go into somebody's house and they say, "Beware of dogs by the door, by the gate." Yeah, that was not Paul, what Paul was doing. In Paul's word, they heard something different. In Paul's word, what they were not hearing was there's dog in the compound. Though. Watch out, watch out, watch out. Yeah, go back to verse 1. Finally, my brethren. Yeah, what chapter are you in? You are in chapter 3 of Philippians. What chapter did you read later on, earlier on? Chapter 4 of Philippians. Which one comes before the other? Philippians chapter 3 comes before Philippians chapter 4. So Paul said finally in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Meanwhile, there was a pre-finally. So you see, when you hear us say finally, we are not really final. <laughs> so when you see me do that, I'm following Apostle Paul. So Paul had a final in chapter 3 of Philippians and another final in chapter 4 of Philippians. Both are final. Is it final or is it not final? <laughs> it's final. But so, when you see, can you see how we started from finally in chapter 4? To make sense of I can do all things. Let's try to start from finally in chapter 3. And see what we, what we're to get us to. So let's start from chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Okay? Seems like a new narrative. It seems like a new path. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous. But for you, it is safe. Dear saints, when you see your pastors, your leaders, repeating teachings over and over. What did Paul say? He says, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but to you it is safe. So who gets safety when things are repeated, when it comes to doctrine? It is you. 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 You get that? Yeah? So when we are repeating the same things, don't get accustomed to it. And you've listened to the teachings for the month before. Listen to it again. Hear it again. The church gives an assignment and says, everyone listen to this teaching this month ahead of our cell meeting. Listen to it again. Listen to it again. Listen to it again. Paul says, so it means that, that look at Paul. Pastor Paul says, well, for me to write the same things to you again is not grievous. It's for your safety. How together, when we repeat things as a local church, it's not because we think, it's not because we don't have anything to say. I can tell you for free. It is not because we don't have anything to say. Not that. Not that. I can always tell you, eh? see, we can start a new series on Sunday. I'm talking of today is Friday. Today is Friday, right? Right On Sunday, right? I don't need to prepare my notes. Forget it. Do you, you see day one? Yeah, day one. Now get to your Bible, right? I taught you all for an hour, 30 minutes, right? And I told you I didn't pass my fourth, third or fourth line. So it means that what I said for one hour, 30 minutes were mostly from the wealth of knowledge I've acquired over the years. And why was I doing that? It's because I was looking for different ways to re-emphasize the same thing I'm saying over and over and over again. Yeah, trust me, the things we've given ourselves to are all together, right? It's not to brag. The things we've given ourselves to, right, we can actually take a journey and keep teaching from now till next year, till two years' time, three years' time, four years' time, five years' time. Right, and we'll stay teaching God's word, and almost every service you might some, somehow one way or the other hear something new or something that is on new or whatever it is, without us studying. Yeah, but why do you think your pastors, for instance, will take our time, go over their notes over and over and over and over and listen again and over and over? Yeah, for instance, we've done engaging the scripture for about two months right now. Right, not that I don't know what is in my notes, but guess what? Between today. And Sunday, I will still go through my engaging scripture notes and refine it for that service. Sometimes I can get the Spirit of God can lead us to another direction. It happens sometimes in our meetings. But I'm trying to say that when you see that we're repeating the same things, don't get tired of it. I know that this meeting, pastor will start from Luke 24. I know that this meeting, pastor will say, and say, our pastor will say, the word profitable is advantageous. You see, in all your notes, write it down. The only way I've gotten used to seeing it. You see, a lot of times, I read scriptures and I don't quote. In fact, it was my wife that put them my treasure to read a couple, couple maybe months ago. I said, I, I quote scriptures and I'm not looking through in the Bible. I didn't, I didn't pay attention. If, if you trace back to the beginning of this meeting, when I was quoting 7 Timothy 3, right, for the first three verses that I was quoting there, my Bible wasn't open. 
What am I saying? The more you keep seeing it, the more you keep checking it, yeah, the more, and the reason it was not open is not because I wanted to show I could quote it. It's just that, well, I already went live, right? And my document was open. My document closed and I was trying to open it again. <laughs> you get it? Yeah, so you see me a lot of times, I still go back to it and I open it and I read it again. Yeah, if you see me take notes in special meetings, you'll be bamboozled. <laughs> I would, we take note, we write it, we take note, we write it, we say it again, we, we hear it again, rather, we say it again, we, we hear it again. Yeah, that's the safety that the believer needs in Bible doctrine or Bible interpretation. Don't be tired of hearing the same things over and over again. Paul says it's for your safety. And I say to you today, it's for your safety. Out of following, yeah, it's for your safety. Don't get, don't, don't always be trying to look for something new. Yeah, what's the, what's the new rave? What's the new thing? What's the in thing? In thing, in thing, out thing, in that? Well, see, get yourself actually reserved and, 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 and accept the fact that what you will hear a lot of repetition as long as we pass on you. All together. Yeah, go all the way uh, um, to verse um, one again. So Paul says, finally, my brethren, we just in law to write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Now look at what did he now say in verse 2. Beware of dogs. So what is Paul teaching? Paul is teaching beware of dogs, right? What do you think dogs will mean? Dogs will be a figurative way of speaking of evil workers. How do you know? Look at verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. He's not saying beware of evil workers. Then when you're in the midst of evil workers, beware of the animal dog. No. He now says beware of the concision. Now, that word concision in the Greek word is a Greek word that means infliction of damage. So what is he warning about? That which inflicts damage. So, that which inflicts damage can be referred to as dogs or can be referred to as evil workers. For evil workers are the dogs that inflict damage. Is it making sense to you, right? Yeah? So, what is Paul only about? Animal or people? Yet, he uses the word dogs. All together. Now, look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and we put or have no confidence in the flesh. Look at verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. So Paul is saying, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. We don't put our confidence in the flesh. Paul says, but though <laughs> I might also have confidence in the flesh. That means, Paul is saying, if you want to go into fleshly works, I can brag about it. But take that word, fleshly words, as a very careless statement for now. It will come in handy soon. Okay, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, Paul says, I more. What a confidence. So he now puts in context what it means by what? Confidence in the flesh. I want to get that. So Paul is not saying if he comes to fornication, ah, I more. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. If he comes to stealing, I more. You know what I said? The word, take it careless. In verse 3, but to come in handy shortly. Yeah? So look what it says. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. That means, if Paul is saying, if I wanted to brag about the things of the flesh, I can brag. You know, in our world, if we hear that, what you are hearing is, I want to brag about, I can sleep with more people than you can think about. I can I can steal more than any other person. No. So what it says. It says, if any other man thinketh that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, Paul says, I more. What did he say in verse 6? I was circumcised on the eighth day. So what is Paul doing? He's now reading out his CV. And what is his CV? What, what is the subtopic of his CV? Activities of the flesh I can boast about. <laughs> right? He said, well, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. That means you want to know my father's father's father. I'm Jewish. <laughs> I have to get out from Israel. Yeah? He says, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. He says, when it comes to the law, I'm a Pharisee. You know what it means to be a Pharisee? Yeah, that's somebody who is extensively given to the documentation of the teachings of Moses or the writings of the law, so to say. All together, right? So look at verse, verse 4 again. He says, If any other man thinketh that he might, if any other man, so, Paul, so who is the any he's talking about? He's talking about the people that inflict damage. That is the evil workers he spoke about in verse 2. So he's saying that these evil workers that I'm asking you to be aware of, if I were to put my CV beside their own, they don't stand me. I want to get up. They don't stand me. So that was fine. Circumcised on the eighth day 
of the stock of Israel. We read all of that. Look at verse 6. Concerning zeal. So Paul says, when it comes to circumcision, I was circumcised on the eighth day. What is circumcision on the eighth day? It's a Jewish practice that is done to children that are born on the uh, uh, born. It's a Jewish practice done on the eighth day after children are born for men. Altogether, right? So he was describing when he was a legalistic human being. He said, when it comes to zeal, when it comes to persecuting the church. He says, as touching the righteousness which of the law, I am blameless. What a brag. I'm blameless. Paul says, I'm blameless. Paul says, I'm blameless. Paul says, I more. I do more. Are you following me today? Right? So when it came to righteousness which of the law, keeping the law of the books, Paul says, I kept the law of the books. If you want to, if, if right standing were to be by your works, Paul says, I am blameless. That's what he's saying. That means a believer, whilst he's hearing that the sins are forgiven, can actually be blameless. Can actually, as much as possible, do the work. Every time. All together. Now look at verse 6, verse 7. So he said, when it comes to zeal, forget it, I'm there. Is it zeal? I have zeal. When it comes to persecuting church, look at these evil workers. Look, when, when they give, before they were born again, I was there when they killed Stephen. That's what Paul is saying. <laughs> persecuting church, I was there. It was on my leg. They, they killed him. On my watch, they killed Stephen. On my watch. I watched. In fact, I was the last person. Uh-huh. Yeah. So Paul is saying, if we were to go that route, I would brag about it. So everything he's been talking about from verse 4 to verse 6 was to bring out his CV to stand side by side with the CVs of evil workers in verse 2. So everything he has spoken about, they were gained to him. So now look at verse 7. What did he now say in verse 7? Say, but what things were gained to me? Those I counted for loss. So Paul says they were gain things, gainful things to him that he could brag about. He could brag about. He could have chosen to brag on those facts. Like on the eighth day from the house of Benjamin, Zealous, persecuted the church. But he says, but for the sake of Christ, I counted as loss. So though they were gainful to him, as he could hold on to them and establish them and you know brag about them. But what did he do? He so. That means it was something he deliberately did and counted as loss. Now, mind you, he didn't say they are loss. No, he chose to count them as loss. So he let go of it. So there were some things he was holding on to with his hands. What did he do? He let go of it as loss so that he can hold on to something else. Let's see what he was going to hold on to. He says, but what things were gained to me do that counted loss for Christ? He says, verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things. So what will all things be? Not everything in his life. All those things. Can you see how it's making sense now, right? So when he says, yeah, I count all things but loss for the excellent. It's when he say, all those things in my CV, I could brag about. I can sign on the eighth day, house of Benjamin, for our seal when it comes to the law, Zillius, persecuting the church. He says, I count all those things. Is it making sense to you, right? Yeah? You follow it? Yeah? So he says, I count all those things but loss. For what? So I was holding them to them. To, I was holding on to them. I could have been holding on to them, but I let go of them as loss. Not they were lost. I counted them as lost. That means I relieved my pressure and strength, and strength and emphasis on them and let it go so that I can embrace something else. What did he say? He says, for the excellency of the knowledge of God, of Christ Jesus, my Lord. So Paul is saying, rather than boasting righteousness by works, I rather boast in righteousness by faith. Now what he's saying? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung. You know what he says? He says, see, when it comes to this thing, you know, I count it as dung. That word there, dung, is gotten from the word escritia, you know, uh, uh, or crap, you're sorry, rubbish or nonsense. I was together. He says, I count it as loss. So Paul, in the real sense, said, when it comes to this matter, you can't brag with me, oh, you can't brag with me. All those things in my CV, they are there, oh, but it's me that left them there so that I can embrace the knowledge. Of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. So, is he saying he lost his house, he lost his job? No, all things will be all these things on my CV. I hope you are learning, right? I hope you are learning. I hope you are learning. I hope you are taking notes all together. I hope you are learning. I hope you are taking notes. Okay, let's go ahead. So, he says, 
Um, I can't them but dumb. That's a scripture. That's like rubbish. That's nonsense. Or trash. That I may win Christ. So he, what is he talking about? Is he talking about something he wants to do or something he has done? He's something he has done. He says, I counted this CV as loss. So for Christ's sake, that means I have counted is in the past tense. He says, I suffer these things, suffer the loss of these things and count them as done that I may win Christ. No, no, it's not a future thing. It's something he has done. All together, right? So he says, and so that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own CV. You get that, right? Not having my own CV. Not having my own CV. So what is Paul saying? Yeah, I counted my CV as trash and received the CV of God about me where God writes about who I am in his son. That's what he's saying. He says, I, 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 I not having my own right. So what is righteousness? Righteousness of works. I could boast about being zealous. I could boast about the things I do. I am there. What did he now say? He says, riches of the law, but that which is through faith. So Paul is teaching two kinds of righteousness. Righteousness by works, righteousness by faith. Righteousness by works is his own righteousness. Righteousness by faith is putting your faith in the work of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, if you want to come to both matters, eh, if you want to know who I really am, when it comes to the bragging of righteousness by works, I qualify. I, he says, I'm more blameless. I was together, right? He says, that I may know him. Is I may know him equal to that I may win him in verse 8. Yeah? So that I may win him in verse 8 is equal to that I may know him in verse... So how do you read verse 10 properly? Read it properly from what? Verse 9 or verse, from verse, verse 1 definitely. Right? But look at verse 7 again. But what things were gained to me... So what things were gained to me, I counted as loss for Christ. Okay? Ye doubtless, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Are you, are you watching me? Right? Look at it again. Right? But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss. Yeah? My CV, I counted loss for Christ. Okay? So, he's saying the same thing. You, you, you know how you know how when I teach, you hear me say things like, let me say that differently. Yeah? Let me say it again. Yeah? That's what Paul is doing. Paul is saying, well, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He's saying, he doubtless, I count all things but loss. That's my CV for the excellency. So what he calls Christ in verse 7 now comes in as excellency of the knowledge of Christ in verse 8. I was together, right? He says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all these things. Are you watching me? Right? I do count them but dung. So all these things are the dung that I may win Christ. So he first calls it Christ. Because of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, then he says that I may win Christ. Yeah? And be found in him. Are we together? Not having my own righteousness, what I could boast about, what I could boast about, but it made it dumb. Are we together? Right? Which is in the law, or which is of the law, but that, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus. The righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him. So what, I, what is he saying as that I may know him? The same thing as that I may know the excellency or be a practical of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Verse 8. Christ, verse 7. I was together. Win Christ, verse 9. Uh, verse 8. Be found in him, verse 9. So that I may know him and the power. So Paul is saying, I let go of my CV that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So rather than boast on the righteousness of works, I'm boasting on righteousness by faith. Hallelujah. That's what the saint needs to brag about. That's what the saint needs to boast about. That's what the saint is loud about. Hold together that your righteousness is by faith, not by works. That's what Paul is teaching. So I left all those my CV. My, you know what CV is? Curricul curriculum vitae or vitae or what do you call it? Uh, what, what, um, what do you call it again? CV, resume, whatever you call it. He says that I may know him. So he counts some as loss. He counts one as excellency. So what so that means Paul rates. So Paul is teaching about two righteousness, but rates one righteousness over the other. Which is the one that is over the other? The righteousness that is by faith in Christ Jesus. Altogether. 
I was gathered. So the excellency of the knowledge of Christ is a greater, greater is greater rated than the righteousness of the works of the law. So Paul was teaching about two worlds. Loss of all things, yeah, right? And the things that are gotten by his relationship and coming into Christ. All together. So what is Paul doing? He's doing a contract of two types of righteousness, right? Well, you see, when it comes to righteousness of the law, well, I'm blameless, so, but even though I'm blameless, I'm not hinging my, Christ, my salvation on the righteousness of works. I'm hinging it on the righteousness by faith in Christ Jesus. All together. All together. So you must understand that you know, Paul, when we go through writings of scriptures, we need to pay attention to how the Bible is written. You see, how did we get to the conclusion of what we just got to today? It's simple. We just read in context. We just, I wish we could read a lot in context. For instance, Matthew 24, for instance, a lot of us go to Matthew 24, you know, and you just say, oh yeah, you know, that was rapture, 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 rapture means that, you know, and you know, uh, you all know the story, yeah? He says, when, when the last day shall come, yeah, two people shall be in the field, you will be farming corn, your, your sister will be farming, farming beans, or farming uh, rice, right? And your sister will disappear, they'll be looking, ah, wait, you know, even some of us still believe in that disappearance, but if you look through scriptures contextually, you see, that thing you call rapture is not, not taught as a disappearing. It's not. Yeah? You see, ah, two men will be in the field. One will be sowing. The other will not be. The other one will be sowing with you. We just leave. He say, ah, don't go without me. Yeah? But if we read in context, just, just go back and read it in context, right? Just, just for starters, we'll, we'll teach it some of these days. But one of these days. Yeah, but just go back and read in context. You'll find out that Matthew 24, actually, the one who remains is the one that is saved. The one who, in quote, disappears is the one that is in trouble. For disappearing there is actually thought as being captured. You'll be wondering, ah, how did we now get to the conclusion that the one that disappears is the one that is missing? Or is the, or is the one that is raptured? That is now in heaven. So on the last day, on the last day, on the literary that can be raptured. Yeah. But we just actually read things into the Bible. Just like the word Antichrist as well. Only one author in the out of 66 books, only one author used the word Antichrist. But today, people go back to Genesis and they see Antichrist in Genesis. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Even the book that a lot of us associate with Antichrist, the book of Revelation, the Bible was not, the book of Revelation does not use the word Antichrist in Revelation. John is the only author. While she wrote Revelation, he didn't use that word in the book of Revelation. But he used it in his letters, First John, Second John. Just go back to 1 John, 2 John this night. It will just help you. Go back to 1 John, 2 John. Read from verse 1. Read all the way up to, up to the end of chapter uh, 1 John, 2 John. And you find out that Antichrist is on the earth already. John never spoke about a being that will come from a different world. Just, just read it. You see, if we can practice more and more the attribute or the attribute or the, 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 the what's the word? The app, um, the, the culture, let me use that word, of reading, it will save us a lot of mess. Just read. Just read. Just read. Just read. See, okay, we know there's Greek, there's Hebrew Bible, but at least for starters, before you buy it, you, you've ordered it from Amazon or eBay. They said it will come in July, and uh, in July 2027. Uh, before that time, just read. Just read. Not really trying to look for Rema. You know, some of us, we, we open the Bible to look for Rema. What is God saying to me with this verse? You will, you will, you must get something. Something must be said to you in your ignorance. Something will, must be said to you. So we don't study the Bible. Try to expect, oh, wow, Psalm 9. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decree and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. So turn aside. Hmm. 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 I see my government. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, no, you are just deceiving yourself. Get yourself more into the culture of reading. Read through. Read through. Read through. You see, the man called Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah, right? And you see, when he gets to Isaiah chapter 56, or is it, no, Isaiah 56 or, yeah, 56 or thereabout, or 60, he says, who shall believe our report? I think it's 56. Right? Who shall believe our report? So Isaiah wrote what you call 55 books. Then gets to the point that says, who shall believe our report? That means you've got to read Isaiah holistically as a book. If you go back to Isaiah for instance, Isaiah 7, right? And speaks about, you know, about the birth of an virgin shall conceive, right? Before you get to the Greek word, just read the narrative. Just read, go to Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 1. Let me just show you one more before we go to there. 
Isaiah chapter 1. Yeah. You know, there's a scripture we used to use when we were growing up. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I have not, not my parents. I have prayed that prayer point. Every Uzziah. Every King Uzziah. That is depriving me from seeing the Lord. What are you living for? So my soul catch fire and die. Like I always tell you, the moment you switch to tongues, you've left that prayer behind. <laughs> I was together. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Bible grammatical um, language and its construction will just show you that what he's saying is that a point in time in history that shows, right, when I saw, uh, uh, when I had an experience or an encounter was just linked to an experience that everybody knew altogether, right? When you see in the year that Queen Elizabeth passed or died, I was together, that was the year I bought my first biro. Queen Elizabeth did not have to die before you bought your first biro. Just a, it's just a point in time T you are trying to bring into the reference of man. Simple. Bible interpretation. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. I was going to do Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 7. But let me just show you one more in Isaiah verse 7. It says, um, Look at verse 17. Isaiah 1, 17. Oh, finally. Finally, look at Isaiah 1, 17. Learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead the widow. Now, that's an instruction that someone can wake up and just run with it and just and go and open NGO. No, no NGO is non government or go and open charity. And they say, What's your watch text on their logo? They just put Isaiah 1 17. Well, that's good, but that's not as much what Isaiah 1 17 is saying. So let's try backtrack the way we did Philippians 4 and Philippians 3. Wash you, make you clean. Mm, verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, mm, verse 14, your new moons are your appointed feast, my soul hated. Mm, okay, fair. Verse 13, bring no more vain oblation. Okay, fair. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me. Okay, fair. Verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of our sacrifice unto me? Uh, okay, fair. Look at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers. Okay, that seems to be the beginning of another conversation. It can fly as the beginning of another conversation. Here, you know, when you say, Thus says the Lord. Yeah, you see, for instance, when we minister in church, we can say, Thus says the Lord, right? And let's say we identify someone by the things of the Spirit, right? And we say, This is who this word is for, right? Then from that moment, you begin to pay attention, particularly for yourself, right? So what it says, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye ruler of Sodom, give yes to the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of the sacrifice unto me? Says the Lord. I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and and the fat of fed beasts. I would delight, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks. I together. Go back to verse 19. Go quickly to verse 19. It says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Some of you, that might be your favorite verse, but sorry, I'm going to take it away from you today. Okay? So, if you be willing and obedient, the Bible says if you are willing, just be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. What is the good of the land? Contracts. Uh, contracts. Uh, a job. A job that are paying you salary that is more than what you were before. Somebody is staying any more than you, and the person is not willing and obedient. <laughs> Have it together. I know nothing hurts the believer and dancing when somebody who is not serving Jesus <laughs> is making a lot of money. <laughs> right? If you're willing and obedient, you're in the glory of land. So you have to understand what is being said. Backtrack to verse 18. Backtrack to verse 17. Backtrack to verse 15. Then we'll start from verse 10. I was together. Look at verse 12. He says, when you come to appear before me, who had required this of your hands to tread my court? Bring no more vain oblation. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moon Sabbath, the calling of assembly I cannot away with. It's iniquity even to the solemn meeting. Your new moons, your appointed face, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me, and I'm weary to bear them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my face. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. What is he saying? They are sacrificing animals for the wrong cause. That's what he's saying here. Yeah? Yeah, so he now says, Now wash yourself in verse 16, make yourself clean. How did he expect them to do that? He says, Put away the evils of your doing. So it means that cutting up, killing all those animals and doing all those feasts and all those things to try to cut, he called them evil of their doing. All together, right? He says, Cease to do evil. Look at verse 17, learn to do well. So can I see why learn to do well now makes sense? Learn to do well is speaking to a people that were doing something he called evil doing. 
Let me do well. Seek judgment. We leave the oppressed. Judge the father. Let's for the widows. So let me say, the, all the rams you are wasting and say you are doing sacrifice to me as God. People can eat. People can benefit from it. Human beings can eat it. Yeah? You see all those people that practice uh, uh, um, diabolical power. I've never asked yourself a question. They ask you to bring goats. They offer the blood to the gods. Who is eating the meat? <laughs> Who is eating the meat? Yeah, you are bringing when you when they say bring goods, say bring a three three month old kid, then bring an antelope. You go to the market and go and find it. You drag it like somewhere that they are pursuing, right? You take it to the shrine or the temple. Are we together? Then they say they slice the head. They slice the head. Why don't they give you back the goat to take it back to the market to sell? They slice the head, the blood pour inside your bowl. You put it inside your bowl, you put it after your head. Then you now turn your back and you go. What now happened? They roast the meat. Hallelujah. They roast the meat. So what is God saying? Don't waste your blood trying to get blood to appease me. No, no, no. That meat, uh, everybody should go home and eat it. Now what he's saying? Learn to do well. We leave the oppressed. There are those that are fatherless. They don't have food to eat. Give them what to eat. Now, what I'm, I'm not saying go and open an NGO. I'm talking to the people that Isaiah is talking to. That's the context. Okay? Look at verse 16. Come now, let us reason together. Says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. So it means that the, the reason they were shedding blood is to tackle sins. But the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sins. Hebrews teaches you that. So it's not just Hebrews that teaches that. Isaiah teaches it as well. That blood of bulls and goats could not take away their sins. Hallelujah. If it could, they would not need to renew it every year. Right? So he says, come now, let's do it together. Says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing. So he has said, come, let's do it together. And he's saying to you, if you are willing, and obedience. Is it not basic? Do you understand? Do you get it? Right? You have a daughter. You have a daughter. She's in her room. Right? I say, come, let's go and buy ice cream. And you say to her, if you are willing and obedient, that means you want to obey my instruction of come, let's go and buy ice cream. You will eat ice cream. Do you get the point? So what would be the good of the land? It can't be money. It can't be job. It can't be contract. It can't be new house. It can't be car. It's just materialism that is enveloped your heart. The good of the land. Uh, I, I, I will eat. When, when, when my left step into Dubai, everything become mad. Everything, all things are mine. <laughs> when they are waiting to carry you, it's still plenty. It's still fine. So he says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat it. So what is the good of the land? It has to do. Because what is he offering? It has to do with the forgiveness of sins. In what? In verse. 18. So what's the good of the land? The forgiveness of sin that God offers by his spirit. I went together. Go back to Second Timothy chapter 3. This is the final, final. Hallelujah. I hope you've been instructed by today's teaching. <laughs> Let's close up in Second Timothy chapter 3. No, we'll go to Romans 15 first. Sorry, final before the final. No, my final is Second Timothy, yeah? But just go to Romans 15 first, okay? Whatsoever things were written at full time were written for our learning. Did you learn today? You learn today by looking through scriptures. Right? We went to Leviticus today, remember earlier on? We did, we, we've actually come a long way today. Good to have your attention span. You see, you can listen to God's word for a long time. You see, you can. Yeah? You know, ah, won't, you, won't, you, won't you tune off? Well, you tuned off. Uh, you actually tuned off intentionally. It's not because your attention span is short. I've not noticed some of you, you watch a seasonal, a seasonal movie. Right, and for, for me, I don't even when I watch movies, I, I, I don't know what is happening. So, if you play a movie I've watched before again, I might not know until the last scene. I'm like, oh, it's like I've watched that movie. Why? Because when I watch movies, I just forget. But some of you, you will watch a series that is 15, 15 seasons. Yeah, you watch Suits. Some of you have watched Suits five times in your life. And when, when I mean life, I mean in just the first from the first time you bought a laptop, which was five years ago, you watch it five times. Yeah, and you can understand. You know, you say the name of this person is that. Yeah, ah, who is that person? Ah, that's the person that you know, that came into the room. Remember, do you remember? Ep- are you in episode fifteen? And uh, season fifteen, track uh, uh, episode twenty. Do you remember? Mm, episode two, track 13, 14, 15, There about. Let's say you have attention span and you maintain the information till till the end. You get it right, so you can listen for long. Yeah, you can. Yeah, this is. What are things we're waiting for? I'm waiting for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. Hallelujah. You see, the writings of the scriptures are written for us so that we can learn through them. Now, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we would end this seminar for this 
Uh, I think it's the last one for this year. Pick it up again next year. Second Timothy chapter three verse uh, uh, three verse sixteen. Okay, chapter twenty three sixteen. So what it says there, or verse fifteen. But from the child that has known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make the wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Dear saints, do with the Bible what is meant to be or what, what needs to be done with the Bible. Well, it's been a beautiful pleasure to bring God's word to you, you to bring God's word your way this precious evening and time of the year. I hope you've been instructed by this week's teaching. Right, I admonish you, go back, yeah, pick the things we've said, listen to them over and over and over and over and over again. Pay attention to the things that we've said over and over and over and over again. We're able to do a, a little a little study. Um, I've got you thinking on a couple conversations here and there, and I hope that it was helpful to um, some of you who asked this question in our last question and answer session. Well, um, I'll come away again in our next um, Navigation Your Bible episode next year, probably March, April. Um, but until then, stay on fire for God. Maintain your consistency in the local church and maintain your fervency in God's will, God's power, God's purpose and plan. Ensure that nothing is priority to you, for you, other than God's will for your life, right? And for UK Church, I'm going to see you all tomorrow. Um, this is the only time that getting your Bible will be five days. Ideally, it should be Sunday through to Sunday or Monday through to Sunday, among, all through the week, basically, right? But the UK Church, we're meeting physically tomorrow. Ensure that you come around at 12 o'clock. Uh, uh, um, tomorrow, uh, uh, appropriate information given to us on the um, um, group chat. And Nigerian Church, I want you all to know that I love you all so dearly. UK Church, I want you all to know that I love you all so dearly. And I believe strongly in God's mighty hand upon your life. And I know that years and decades from now, you that I'm looking at today, or you looking at me today, will be found in God's will, the center of His life, and uh, the center of His will for your life, and you remain consistent. Have a lovely night, Cheers. Good night.